All right, so in dependently typed languages, you often run into this problem where you might define a non-index data type like list and then define a bunch of functions and proofs about it. And then you might define an index variant like vector of essentially the same type. And then you need to redefine uh, all of your definitions all over again, even though, again, they're essentially the same as the originals. And this process can, can continue. So maybe you now have uh, ordered lists, and maybe you now have ordered vectors and so on. So uh, this is a problem having to do with code reuse in the sense that once we've defined these functions and proofs for one of these variants, we should be able to derive them for the others. Now this talk is about generic zero cost reuse, where by reuse we mean if you have something like the vector append function, we want to reuse it to define something like the list append function and vice versa. And by zero cost, we mean the function defined by reuse should have no runtime penalty with respect to the reused function. And by generic, we mean we want to define combinators for the types of our language such that we, the process of reuse can be done incrementally and in a structured way rather than manually and all at once. So by data reuse, we mean if we have something like a vector value, we want to translate it to a list value in the forgetful direction, and we also want to translate a list value to a vector value in the enriching direction. And by program reuse, we mean the same thing for functions. So for example, going back and forth between the vector append function and list append function. And finally, for proof reuse, uh, the same thing for proofs. For, so say the proof of vector append associativity and the proof of list append associativity. And in this talk, we'll restrict ourselves to data and program reuse and only in the forgetful direction. So as an illustration of using the reuse combinators, instead of just defining uh, list append in terms of vector append manually and directly, we want to incrementally apply combinators that give us uh, sub-goals until we eventually uh, reach our solution. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to review manual reuse and then go over manual zero-cost reuse and then finally give some intuition behind the generic development. So for manual reuse, we're going to start here in the Agda language. So these are the standard uh, declarations of the list and vector types in Agda. And for data reuse, we want to write a function, say v2l, that takes a vector and turns it into a list. And if we stop for a moment and uh, look at this function, intuitively it appears that nothing is really happening, right? So uh, nil goes to nil, cons goes to cons, maybe there's some recursion, but otherwise nothing's happening, right? It seems kind of odd. Okay, what could that mean? Well, for program reuse, if we similarly take in a vector append in order to produce a list append, uh, how do we do that? Well, we take in our vector append function, take in our list, apply the vector append to the result of converting both lists from uh, uh, both uh, lists to vectors via L2V, and then taking the final result and converting it from a vector to a list by, via V2L. And so long as in V2L and L2V, if there's nothing really happening there, there's also, by consequence, nothing really happening here, in the sense that really we're just taking in this app V and applying it. So more formally, what might nothing really happening for V2L mean? Well, if it's the case, then maybe we should be able to prove some sort of identity property, right? So for all vectors x's, can we say that V2L x's is x's? And if that's the case, why can't we just write this uh, conversion from vectors to lists directly as the identity function, right? So we get in an x's of type vec, and it appears we don't really need to do anything, so just give it back to the user, right? Uh, well, we can't do this in Agda because something is actually happening there. So in Agda, behind the scenes, it's qualifying constructor names, which I've done manually here. So now we have nil L and cons L and nil V and cons V. And if we revisit V2L and look at, say, the nil case, then we're actually uh, going from nil V to nil L, which is uh, doing something that's actually uh, a real change in Agda's definitional equality. And this is because for Agda, uh, two differently named constructors are actually uh, nominally distinct. So uh, the second thing that's happening is Agda infers arguments for us. So in the definition of vector, if we uh, make the natural number an uh, explicit argument and then look at V2L again, then now if we look at the cons case, we can see that in the input we have a cons V which has a natural number N, and in the output we have a cons L and that uh, N has been dropped. So whereas with uh, with uh, qualification before, maybe we had something happening in the sort of 
uh, nominal equality sense, now we also have something happening in the structural equality sense. So because something is happening, although we can achieve reuse in AGDA, it's not zero cost. So even though we can get a version of list append defined in terms of vector append, internally it's doing these linear time conversions back and forth between lists and vectors. So we pay a performance penalty. So to get rid of this, we're going to talk about manual zero cost reuse, and we're going to move from the theory behind AGDA to a theory where our intuitions that nothing is happening is actually true. And that's going to be the theory behind uh, the dependently typed language Cedil, which was recently open source. So I'll briefly compare AGDA and Cedil here. So AGDA has primitive inductive types, predicative quantification, intrinsically typed terms, and definitional equality defined uh, uh, over, directly over terms. Whereas Cedil has derived inductive types, impredicative quantification, extrinsically typed terms, meaning you can assign a term multiple different types, and definitional equality defined modulo erasing the terms to the untyped lambda calculus. So in uh, Cedil, a term T1 is definitionally equal to a term T2 if and only if erasing T1 to the untyped lambda calculus is beta eta equal to erasing T2. So Cedil is the extrinsic, extrinsic calculus of constructions plus three primitive types. So the first two are relevant to this talk and erased function space and heterogeneous equality. And the last dependent intersection is they're interesting but not relevant to this talk. So of course Cedil has an ordinary non-erased function space which uses the pi, the capital pi quantifier. And to the right we have the standard uh, introduction and, and elimination rules for the pi type. But Cedil additionally has and erase function space using the for all quantifier. Oops. Um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, an additional uh, erased function space using the for all quantifier. So for the uh, introduction rule, we'll notice first that syntactically we have this uh, capital lambda for the erased abstraction. And then additionally, we have this um, constraint in the introduction rule as a premise that says the uh, abstracted variable cannot appear in the free variables of erasing the abstraction body. Uh, and the sort of uh, informal intuition behind what this, what this means is that in, in, in type signatures, we can rely on uh, erased arguments to constrain our data type, like in the type of vector append, but at runtime, vector append cannot depend on the uh, natural numbers. So, and then for the elimination rule of the erased function space, it's exactly the same as the uh, non-erased space, except we have a, uh, the syntax dash to uh, have a special syntax for it. Okay, so the, this is gonna sound funny uh, this in English, but the, uh, the way that you erase non-erased abstractions is uh, by simply removing the domain annotation and then continuing to erase the body. And then for, uh, it's very sensitive. And then to erase, what's going on? <laughs> okay, and then to erase uh, non-erase applications, uh, it's just uh, congruent. And then for the erase function space, we erase uh, erased abstractions by completely dropping the abstraction and erasing to the body. And for erased applications, we completely drop the argument and erase to the function. So before in AGDA, we derive these uh, or sorry, we declare these inductive types for lists and vectors, and in Cedil now we will derive them. And for that, we will simply uh, define the lists and vectors in terms of their uh, standard church encodings. Now, I will say that actually here we use intersection types so we get induction principles and Mendler encodings so that we get efficient predecessors, but uh, for simplicity, I'll pretend like we're using church encodings in this talk. Okay. So uh, it's uh, easy to define nil L and nil V as their standard church encodings. And in blue here, I'm beginning to highlight the, the erased parts of these definitions. And uh, in the bottom, if you kind of squint away at the blue, then you'll see that erasing nil L is equal to erasing nil V, and both of these are equal to the church encoding of nil in the untyped lambda calculus. And there's a similar story for cons L and cons V. The big difference being for cons V, we have this uh, additional erase uh, natural number argument. And, but again, if you uh, remove all of the blue, then it'll be the case that erasing cons L is equal to erasing cons V, and both of these will erase to the church encoding of cons, uh, and again, in the untyped lambda calculus. Uh, 
Now, the thing to notice is that if we had to find vectors using the non-erased function space pi for the natural number argument of cons, then our uh, equation at the bottom would not hold. So it's crucial that instead we use the erased function space, the for all quantifier. And heterogeneous equality in Agda first appears to be similar to that in, or in Cedillo, first appears to be similar to that in Agda. So on the right we have the introduction rule, which says uh, 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 by beta or reflexivity in Agda, REFL, uh, any term t is equal to itself. But as we've seen uh, in Cedillo, we can have a nil L and a nil V of different types but their erasures can still be the same. And this allows us to have positive evidence beta that nil L is equal to nil V despite them having different types. So in an intrinsic theory like Agda, you could make the statement that nil L equals nil V at different types, but you would never be able to prove it. Whereas in an extrinsic uh, theory like Cedille, you can actually prove this as well. So beta uh, erases the identity function just so we don't have to have some special con uh, constant. Uh, beta, we instead want to always erase the untyped lambda calculus. And then the elimination uh, rule for the identity type is a standard uh, rewrite primitive row. And so if terms T1 and T2 are propositionally equal, then anywhere in a type capital T, we can replace T1 by T2. And the interesting thing to focus on is this extra elimination rule for the equality type phi. So it says, if we have a term T1 of type capital T, and T1 equals T2, then we can say this phi expression also has type capital T. And the significance of that is in the erasure rule. So if we look at the erasure of phi, phi always erases to the term within the curly braces, or in this case, T2. So uh, the consequence uh, is that phi basically means if you have a term T1 of type capital T and T1 equals T2, you can also get a view of T2 also having type capital T. Uh, but this is, of course, modular uh, erasure, but uh, that's the name of the game in Cedille where definitional equality has erasure uh, baked in. So before, we, we sort of uh, said, in V12, it appears nothing's happening, and maybe we should be able to prove this identity property and then go further and directly define a version of V12 as the identity function. And now in Cedille, we can actually do this. So we can define the identity property uh, for all uh, vectors x's, v 2 l x's is equal to x's, and this is yet another case where in intrinsic type theory we could state this theorem, but in extrinsic type theory we are all, uh, able to prove it. And then, although we cannot syntactically define v 2 l bang as the identity function, uh, we can instead use uh, the phi expressions that were previously introduced uh, and then reference the identity property that we just defined in order to define a function from vectors to list which modulo, uh, which after erasure will be the identity function. So again, if we kind of squint uh, at this phi expression and remove everything except what's in the braces, then we will get lambda x's dot x's. And now to give some intuition behind the generic development, uh, we, the, the, the combinators in the generic development operate over this type of identity functions, which is a type abstraction that represents the existence of an identity function from type A to type B after erasure. So more precisely, the type id AB is uh, defined as uh, for, every, uh, for every A of type capital A, there is a B of type capital B such that B is equal to A. And here's again, uh, you might start to recognize a pattern. This is a type that we can perfectly reasonably define in Agda, but uh, in Agda, it doesn't really have any interesting inhabitants. Whereas in Cedille, we can actually have interesting inhabitants, where by interesting, I mean the case where A is not equal to B. Okay, so now uh, if we have a value F of this uh, identity function from A to B, we'll, we're able to eliminate it to get a proper function from A to B that has the crucial property that after erasure, it, it is the identity function. And then we can go on and define combinators that take in these id types and return them. So uh, we solve program or function type reuse by defining a combinator which in the forgetful uh, case returns the, the following type. So I've omitted the arguments, but this is what it would return. So it is an, an identity function where in the domain we have an erased index preserving function, and in the codomain we have an ordinary function. 
and then we solve data or fixed point type reuse by defining a, a, a combinator which returns an identity function where the domain is an index fixed point and the codomain is a non-index fixed point. And um, uh, in this generic setting, we define lists as the fixed point of a standard list signature, but we define vectors as the fixed point of a non-standard vector signature. And the non-standard part is that the sums and products in the uh, signature have this subscript L, with, and the L indicates that the left component is actually erased. So if we recall from before, it was crucial for our equalities to work out that the natural number argument of, of cons for vectors was erased, and that's exactly what's happening here. And then additionally, in our generic setting, we also uh, explicitly record constraints on the indices for the vectors, but we also want those to be erased. So I will uh, end with a sort of visual depiction of how we would use our combinators uh, to incrementally uh, reuse a function, to incrementally define a pen for list in terms of a pen for V. So we will begin with this copy type combinator. And if you look at the top, I have the type signatures for vector append and list append. And in blue, what I'm doing now is highlighting the part of the type being solved by this particular combinator application. So copy type handles this uh, sort of shared prefix of the append functions, this, this for all A part. And after that, we uh, apply the forgetful function type reuse combinator, all R to R, which will handle the uh, first proper uh, argument of the append functions to contraver uh, contravariantly convert the list to a vector. And uh, you'll notice that the all R to R is applied to L to V. So that's why this extra argument is there to show how to convert the list to the vector. And then we apply the same combinator once more for the second proper argument. And finally, we're left with the result of vector append, uh, and then we covariantly convert the vector back to a list. And the uh, thing to mention about uh, when you sort of define this reuse function uh, in terms of these uh, uh, identity types, uh, you're defining the reuse function at the interface of the type signatures. So once you have this, uh, you can actually get back a version of app L for any app V, uh, dis regardless of what the implementation of uh, a particular append for F is, right? And this becomes important for things like uh, sorting functions, where generally you have uh, a sorting function, uh, many sorting functions with the same type. So, and then, uh, you know, you might have quick sort and merge sort and so on. And here you would only need to perform the process of uh, reuse once, and you could reuse any implementation for sort. For, so for the conclusion, we hope that this is a step in the right direction for making dependently type languages more usable via code reuse without runtime penalty. And I invite you all to the CDL tutorial tomorrow. And I am wrapping up my postdoc at UIowa, so please talk to me. And finally, in the paper, you can find a number of different things. Uh, the one thing I'd like to highlight is a case study between, uh, that shows reuse between the untyped and intrinsically typed uh, STLC terms which share a non-trivial relationship because uh, not every untyped term is also an intrinsically typed term. And that's where things get interesting, and that's it. Thank you. So first off, the big one. Yeah. Why impredicativity? Because it's inconsistent with all sorts of axioms that people otherwise might want to assume, like choice or certain kinds of classical reasoning, or perhaps classical logic generally? So I think the, the Cedillo language sort of started out as an experiment to, because you know, there are good reasons to not use it, say like, OK, well, uh, despite that, what can we actually gain if we do use it? And it turns out you gain actually quite a lot. So as mentioned before, the primitive types in Cedillo are all non-inductive. And despite that, we can derive inductive types uh, as well as index types as well as inductive recursive types, as well as inductive inductive types, which not even Koch has. So we have this very simple core, and we can derive all these weird classes of data types that we expect from Agda without them being primitive. Cool. So how does the erased function space in Cedil compare to irrelevant arguments in Agda or to new Perl's dependent family intersections? 
Um, so for the new Perl, the comparison is uh, fairly direct. And for Agda, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure, uh, actually. I'd have to, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a difference. I know that using these in Agda, you can get sort of uh, runtime performance uh, improvements, but I'm not sure how it works with Agda's definitional equality. So what is the type of L to V? Don't you need an existential? Okay, so for uh, L2V, um, that's another interesting part that I, for simplicity, omitted, but L2V is actually a dependent uh, function. So we actually go from uh, X's of type list to a vector of uh, whose length is the length of X's, right? So all of these combinators where I showed, for example, the, the id abstraction, you actually also need a more general version, a dependent id abstraction, so you actually have dependent identity functions, which seems like a weird concept, but turn out to be useful. And so I know you say that you uh, compare to ornaments in the paper, but mm -hmm. the question came up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So how would you compare this to the theory of ornaments, and is it reversed, or? Yeah, in a sense it is reversed. So at least with the original syntactic uh, 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 definition of ornaments, you sort of had this a priori notion where you have a list and then you'll derive a vector type from that and then sort of get some, some casts uh, after that. Whereas in our setting, it, the setting is uh, sort of more like you're a, you're a programmer and you have a library where some stuff is uh, defined for lists and sometimes it, some stuff is defined for vectors and then we kind of want to mix, mix and match after the fact. So, so that's one answer. Another answer is um, for, um, Ornaments, you can both refine indices and add data, whereas in our setting, we can only uh, refine indices and add erase data. Uh, but uh, as a benefit, our sort of conversions are zero cost. And uh, although I think they are to some degree orthogonal, so I think there is promising work to combine the two. And finally, in the later semantic description of ornaments, uh, we have uh, ornaments defined as the fixed point of containers. Uh, however, this requires extensional type theory, whereas here we semantically define data types as fixed points of something like functors, which do not require extensional equality. So we remain in intentional uh, type theory. So with pervasive heterogeneous equality, is there a risk that two terms with different semantics might have the same representation? Um, I suppose so. Uh, um, and then, uh, does the, I think these are related. Does Sedil have decidable type checking? No. So uh, one thing, so Sedil has, um, so Sedil is consistent as a logical theory, and it has algorithmic but not decidable type checking. And I should say that sort of I worked on this system for over a year, and it's never in, uh, infinite loops sort of by accident. It's always just me being, uh, you know, wanting to send uh, uh, an email to the mailing list to say, like, hey, look, I can make an artificial example of a loop. And, you know, it doesn't, it, it, anecdotally, it hasn't come up on accident. And then how does it compare to the calculus of implicit constructions? Right. Uh, so it's very similar, um, except we have the uh, type additions. Um, so this is Mikkel's work. We have the type additions of uh, the heter heterogeneous equality and uh, intersection types. And the intersection types is the part I didn't get to talk about. I think we have time for one more. Um, does this work give any new challenges in dependently typed languages ba uh, with, compared to this uh, safe zero cost coercion for Haskell, which does something kind of similar for Haskell's new type mechanism? So does it, so I would ask like how, how does the Haskell Coercions, what, what challenges they, do, do they introduce? Like, so uh, now I'm trying to remember, but I, I believe the thing you want to avoid is mapping the identity function over a list when you're unwrapping a, a new, like a list of a new type. Um, so mapping the identity function over a list when you're when you're what? Say that again? When you unwrap like a new type wrapper in Haskell, then uh -huh. you can have like a projection out of it that at runtime is a no op. But if you have a list of those new, wrapped new types, then you still have to map that identity, that runtime identity function. I think it's better that you find the, the questioner find you offline. Yeah. Okay. 
So we, we do have examples of uh, doing this for higher order functions too, where we have maps of identities, and those still end up being identities, maybe surprisingly. And that is in part due to the fact that we have both beta and eta equality. Most of what I showed here was a simple case where we erasure only required beta equality, but you can get many more equalities due to eta equality. And maybe that's the answer. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much, and let's thank the speaker one more time, please.